Welcome to Case by Case. This is a podcast brought to you by Luke Zadkovich and Callum Chain of Xylofloid Zadkovich. Hello, Callum. How are you today? I'm very good today. I'm excited. This is one of my favorite legal topics from recent times topic of subjects in a charter party. You know it well. <laughs> You've had to deal with it quite a bit, hey, over the last little while. We've had a few of them. Um, so it's a, it's a familiar topic. And we are joined by an expert on the topic without putting too much pressure on our guest. Yeah, exciting. Welcome, uh, arbitrator Tim Hartland. Hello, Tim. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Thank you very much for having me. I think you have put on too much pressure already, Callum. But- <laughs> No, as if you've been listening in, you uh, you know we we don't take our, ourselves too seriously here. We like getting into the the meat of the cases, but um, we also like to have a have a laugh as we go. So, look, thank you, thank you for um, jumping on today, Tim. Uh, we're really excited to have you have you with us. Uh, I think we've got an interesting case to get our our teeth into and i i should just give a a a quick intro by all means jump in here tim if if i've got any of it wrong but i understand you've been in the trade and and trading uh dry bulk shipping um vessels for for 30 odd years and you've kind of experienced most angles during that time whether it's ship owners mining houses traders broking companies um, across various jurisdictions like London and Hong Kong, the US and the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, so obviously got a lot of uh, hands-on experience in the market. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, a few bumps and bruises along the way, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. And, and Tim's also a, a member of the Institute of Chartered uh, Shipbrokers, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a supporting member of the LMA, LMAA, as well as a member of the Baltic. So, um, great credentials, and um, yeah, thanks again for being on, uh, Callum. Callum, uh, this case today uh, is all about subjects. Um, so, I'll, I'll get to you if it's okay to to give a bit of a, a an intro into the case. And before we do, I'll, I'll just give the citation. For those um, keen followers of uh, of, of the actual um, case name, this is a, a decision of the English Commercial Court. It was a, a decision handed down by Mr Justice Jacobs and the parties involved were DHL Project and Chartering as the claimant and Gemini Ocean Shipping as the defendant. Relatively recent, earlier in this year, this decision was handed down on the 31st of January 2022. I found this fascinated, and it, it throws it throws to a number of areas or topics which we personally are interested in, and, and as a firm are quite interested in, both in the fields of arbitration, looking at the separability of an arbitration agreement with its its main contract, the practice of using subjects when fixing charter parties and how those are lifted and when those are lifted and what subjects actually mean. So very much a shipping type um, topic as well. So yeah, let's get into it, hey? Let's let's get into it indeed. So this was a Section 67 challenge rolled up with an application for a leave to appeal uh, under Section 69 of the Arbitration Act from a arbitration award uh, handed down um, in the absence of any um, of the other side even attending, there was a this was an interesting um, interesting kind of side note on this case is that for the for the initial arbitration, the uh, defendants who ultimately lost simply did not attend because it seemed to have been lost in um, a potentially embarrassed chartering manager's email uh, inbox who just hadn't told anyone that they were uh, fighting a legal case um, until it was finally. They well potentially too late, um, but fortunately they managed to recover the situation by launching the, this challenge slash appeal. Um, Section sixty seven is a challenge on the grounds of jurisdiction. So this is where the uh, the applicant is saying that, that there was no jurisdiction for the for the tribunal to give the award. And section sixty nine is your uh, is your normal grounds for appeal on the, on on the ground that the the law is wrong. A section sixty seven application in that situation you, you get a full rehearing don't you whereas on a on a 69 application 
um, it, it's only on an error of law and, and it's a much narrower window within which to, to bother the court. That's exactly right. So this was a full rehearing of all the issues. Um, in fact, it was a greater hearing of the issues than they had in the original arbitration because both sides turned up. So this really is the, it's, not a, it's, it's in no way narrowed by pro procedure. This is a full hearing of all the issues that were, that were tabled. Um, essentially what this came down to was the question of whether or not a contract had been formed. Um, and I guess as a, as a tangential question, the question of whether or not an arbitration agreement had been formed, even if the contract had not been. And this was a charter party. And in the normal way, the charter party was subject to certain things happening. Um, and the, the key subject here was subject shipper slash receiver's approval within one working day after fixing main terms and receipt of all required corrected certificates slash documents. And the question was whether that subject was lifted effectively um, and, and also separately what the effect of that subject was. How does that, what does that subject do to the creation or otherwise of a charter party? Um, the charterers said that that subject was never lifted. They said that they had never given, um, they'd never received this approval, they'd never lifted that subject. The owners didn't argue the subject was lifted. They argued that the subject could only be, uh, could only not be lifted by charters acting reasonably and they'd acted unreasonably. And that's how they got home in the arbitration. So this was a challenge and an appeal by the charterers to overturn that arbitration award and to say no, this is uh, this this subject was never lifted. The charge party never came into being, um, and nor did the arbitration agreement. So there's no jurisdiction. There's no charge party. There's no claim. And the subject we're we're talking about here was uh, this. We can read out the exact wording of it, but but just in in broad terms, it was um, subject to shipper and receiver's approval. And and one of the first points about this um, this subject was that it required was found to require um, in the in this court decision that it required both uh, shippers and receivers approval so if if just the shippers um, had approved and that had been communicated to the owners that would not have been enough it, it both the subjects had to be lifted Tim did you want to did you want to comment on the the practice just in a broad sense of lifting subjects and 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 what that means in, in the market so it's it's very normal to put subjects on a chartering deal um, the it's widely understood that there are more parties involved in um, getting a deal across the line than just the charterer and the owner um, it probably is also going to have to be run by the ship well in this case the shippers and the receivers to make sure that they're happy with the vessel that's been fixed and the uh, the, the 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 itinerary of the vessel, the size of the vessel, the age of the vessel, so on and so forth. So that's all. This is all very standard stuff. I mean, subjects are wide ranging. Such subjects subjects can be what whatever the, the the two parties agree need to be a precondition to the deal becoming a fully binding contract. The loosest type of subject you could have is something like charter's reconfirmation, where the charter is have, for example, 24 hours to make up their minds whether they want the ship. That's really the owner giving the charter a free option on the ship in a, in a way for 24 hours. Or you can have what, what would be regarded as quite tight subjects, which I think shippers and receivers approval are. That's pretty much the minimum you'd expect a charter to ask for. So yeah, so far it's all been pretty standard. And I was going to raise the same point that we see all different sorts of subjects because you might see subject to management approval, for example, and that, that one often seems to be left in or, or even subject to details, you know, sub subjects like those where it's, it's very clear that there's not a contract until that subject is lifted. Um, and, you know, subject to contract is probably the one that you see the most as lawyers, not just in charter parties, but everywhere. You know, here's, here's our version of the agreement subject to contract. And people know what that means. I mean, you know, they know there's no agreement until the contract is finalized and signed. But I think a point of interest on this in this case is that, you know, as, as you say, Tim, this is quite a narrow, it's quite a specific kind of narrow subject. It's, it's quite clear, at least it looks as though on the face of it, it's quite clear what this contract is subject to. 
you know, it's not it's not subject to charters coming back and saying, we well, yes, we want to go ahead with this deal. It says it's at least, I mean, we'll come on to this because actually it is. It's subject, you know, the contract simply doesn't exist until these, until the, until the subject's lifted. But it appears in its face that this is quite a narrow subject and really what the what the intention of the words looks to be at first blush at least is that if the if the shipper and receiver's approval is granted then the contract will will be formed and if it's not then it won't um but it seems to be it seems that that's not exactly how the um how this was interpreted by the judge it's a really good point callum and, and we'll, we'll come on to it a bit more in, in as we get into this but it's it's important to identify at the outset that in this contract, what we were dealing with was a recap that had the subject to shippers receivers approval at the top of the recap or, or near the top of it, and then all the terms following thereafter, um, with no reference to whether that um, that subject could be reasonably or unreasonably withheld. There's no kind of restriction on it other than that it was subject to shipper and receiver's approval. In the body of, in the pro forma, the incorporated charter party, um, which was incorporated with the usual language that you see, that you see uh, with the word otherwise, so otherwise with logical amendments, the rest of the pro forma comes into the contract. Um, in that part of um, this, this you know, a- alleged contract, um, that was where there was some language around um, the subject could not be unreasonably withheld. And so, so it's really important to identify at the outset that the subject we're talking to in the recap did not have that type of qualification. And there was a big debate about whether the qualification in the pro forma should be read with the unqualified um, uh, subject in the recap or not, whether there was a priority here. Um, and the the recap subject uh, overrode, if you like, or it was it was a a, a, um, a precondition to everything that followed, and and particularly anything that was in the pro forma. And, and the word otherwise, ultimately, the, it, it was the latter. Um, the the judge decided that the recap provision did have priority, um, and the word otherwise meant that um, the pro forma. Um, qualification had to be read in light of um, the recap subject. But it, 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 uh, the reason I wanted to raise it at the outset is because, um, and we talk about this this a lot on the podcast, whether it's from a, a trading perspective uh, out in the field um, for someone like yourself, Tim, or from a lawyer's perspective, if we were involved in writing up the recap or checking a recap, that um, this decision is based on the words in this contract. Had the words from the pro forma been slotted into um, the subject in the recap, the decision might have been different. Um, and if you're seeking to achieve certain outcomes in, in chartering, and here, let's say that the parties had intended for it to be a very narrow subject that was contingent on what, what a third party did, which didn't leave any room at all for the charters to move, the recap could have been drafted in a, in a tighter way to achieve that. I, so I kind of see where, where you, what you're saying there, Luke. But at the same time, I have a lot of sympathy for a party who agrees to this recap and thinks that what it means is that the agreement is subject to the shipper or receiver's approval. And, and actually, the, the, there's a kind of further complication in this case, which is that the, the, the shipper or receiver's approval was not given. So there's really actually very little argument for... Um, for the owners here to say that the contract was fixed because the charters never gave their approval. They never lifted the subject. The shipper and receivers never gave their approval either. So the the kind of underlying thing that was supposed to happen to make the subject be lifted never happened. So they were relying on this slightly tenuous argument about there being a, you know, requirement to exercise this reasonably. Um, But I think that the the judgment goes further than simply saying this was you know this was something that um, it, it's it, what the judgment effectively says is that because the the charge party said subject to shipper slash receiver's approval it meant that there was absolutely no contract until 
that shipper slash receiver's approval was granted and charterers agreed that they lifted this subject. And I think that if you read what that clause says or what that subject says, it doesn't strike me that what the parties are trying to achieve is saying that there's absolutely no contractual effect until shipper slash receiver's approval is driven. I think what they're trying to say is that there's a, there's a suspensive condition to performance of the contract and that suspensive condition is that the shipper or receiver, uh, shipper and receiver's approval is granted. Because it is narrow. It's not, they're, they're not saying, hang on a minute, we're not sure we want to agree this deal at all. They're saying we, we do want to agree this deal, but it's, it's subject to this thing happening. And to, to me, that's different. I, I, you know, I think in this case, it didn't make a difference because the, the judgment would be the same either way. But if you had the same facts as we have here, and instead of it being charters who were trying to uh, pull out the deal, it was owners. If it was owners who had turned around and said, after we've agreed to this, we now want to quit this deal. We, we don't want to be a part of it anymore. And the charters turned around and said, well, we're still waiting to see whether we get approval from the, from the, um, from the shippers and the receivers. So you're still on the hook until we either do or don't get that, that, uh, don't get that um, approval. Then I think it would be a harsh result on the owners for this for this to be to be deemed not a contract at all. I see your point, it, it, and in a way, the facts didn't actually um, you know a- allow a decision on it. In a way, and I think what the judge says on it's probably obita, but I, I agree with you. I agree that had there been both shippers and receivers approval, um, and that had been communicated to the charterers, and the charterers decided for their own reasons not to communicate that uh, approval to the owners, I think it's, it's a tricky point, right? Um, and I think that's what you're driving at, isn't it? Is that We can take it even further. If there had been approval from the shippers and the receivers, they had passed that on to the charterers. The charterers were about to lift this subject and owners then turned around and said, no, the deal's off. Then according to this judgment, owners can still do that. They can still walk away from this deal, even up to the point before the second before charterers send a message saying we lift our subjects. Its owners are still able to walk away from this deal, and I, I find that odd. I was really surprised by the comments that um, uh, Mr. Justice Jacobs made uh, to the effect that um, not only did the shippers and receivers have to lift their subjects, but the charterers had to communicate that to the owners for there to be a deal. I think if you ask most chartering people what those subjects meant, they would say that if charter, uh, if shippers lifted their subject, uh, if shippers approved the ship, if the receivers approved the ship, then the charters would have been obliged to lift the subjects. Um, they wouldn't. They wouldn't have had any latitude there. Um, I think the, the owners, having agreed these subs, would have gone to sleep at night quite comfortable that you know if that had happened, they'd have a deal. That's not what. Um, uh, Mr. Jacobs said, I, I re- remember I remember listening to one of your podcasts a few episodes back when you were talking about the appointment of arbitrators and you said that um, you thought it would probably have a few lawyers scurrying back to their desks to work out whether their own procedures were robust. And I think that this, uh, these words from Mr. Jacobs would, would, have ha- would have exactly the same effect on chartering people. I suppose in a way that's, that's the point that I was trying to make is um, we have seen a number of these subject type matters in practice and um, uh, what, what the words say and what the intention is don't always marry up or they're not as clearly put as, as they could be. Um, and I suppose if it, it, what, what my point is, is if the parties are seeking to achieve certain things in their subjects, that, that it's important to make sure that is um, that is important in no uncertain terms. So if you're wanting to take this outside the hands of your counterparty and make it very clear that this is just a third party situation, um, then you've got to make sure you do that. And I suppose Callum's point is, well, they did do that here. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> My point is they've, they've gone quite far. But I think I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think it's a specific it's a specific thing to subjects right now because there was the case of the Leonidas in 2020 and there's this case now in 2022 and both of them take a hard line on, on this point and both of them um, have were found in each case that the, the particular subject they were looking at was one that prevented there from being any contract until it was lifted. And once you've made that decision as, you know, as the judge, 
once you've made the decision that this subject prevents the formation of a contract, then it is open to anybody to say, well, I walk away. Because until you're contractually bound to do something, you can walk away from it. So, you know, in our hypothetical situation where um, where owners decide to walk away despite shipper and receivers both approving the vessel, but before charters had a chance to communicate it, they're not actually walking away from anything because there's no binding commitment. Do you think, Callum, that he meant that the owners could walk away from the deal as well as the charters on this? I, I, I certainly got the point that the, the charters could um, decide whether they wanted to communicate the uh, shippers and receivers approval to the owners. I didn't necessarily get the point that the owners might be able to do the same thing, but you, 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 you feel as though that's the case, do you? It comes through paragraphs 87 and paragraph 107 of the judgment. And what he's talking about here is the difference between what's called a precondition and what's called a performance condition. And the precondition is something like subject to contract, subject to details. There's a big history of you know different things being preconditions. And if there's a precondition, then there's no deal until the precondition is is removed. And it's not it's not a case of it's only on charterers to um, who can it's only charterers who can who can who can exit the deal. Because if it's a precondition, if it's a true precondition, then there is no deal. There's nothing to nothing to leave. Whereas if it's a performance condition, which is one of those suspensive conditions where the contract's agreed, the contract is you know confirmed by both sides but performance of the contract is subject to something else happening, then that's the kind of thing which, which it would only be, you know, be within charterer's gift only to say no. Um, so I think once you've made the analysis that this is a precondition, it must follow that owners would have been entitled to, um, would have been entitled to withdraw. And, I th- you know, it, it, as, as Luke says, this is this is kind of an obit, an obiter part of the judgment. So that may not be correct, and you know it would be open to a party to argue the opposite. This isn't going to bind them against making those arguments. But I think that has to be the um, the effect of the judgment is that if this is a precondition, then both parties could leave. It's it's probably very fortunate that chartering people don't read too many cases because I think that would cause absolute chaos in the chartering market. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's another point I want to just put to you, Tim, as well, which is I think it, it adds to the analysis. So. This is this subject says sub- subject shipper slash receiver's approval within one working day after fixing main terms and receipt of all required corrected certificates slash documents. There's a strict time period there of one working day after the, after everything's been collected. And I, again, this is we're talking about a hypothetical situation, which just didn't actually happen in this case. Um, so it's no criticism of the case at all. It's just it's just a kind of point of interest around what would have been decided if it was a different you know in a different world. But if we were back in our, in our hypothetical world where owners are trying to, to pull out of this deal, then what's the point of the one working day? Because it's effectively open to both parties to pull out. You know, it, it seems as though they've given charters a grace period to go away and get their, um, get their approvals. Um, but if there is no grace period, if, if owners still have the ability to simply you know, pull out of the fixture, then it's an, it's an odd addition. It's, it, and I'm not sure that there was... Um, well, again, we're in, we're in the hypothetical world, but if you were if you were making that argument, then I think you would be looking at that one working day, um, the effect of that one working day period, and saying we've been giving a, a grace period to do something, but there must actually be a grace period. We must actually have you know some time, you know, as you put it before Tim, a kind of free option to to go ahead with this um, fixture or not. Yes, I mean, I think the owners, I think what the owners thought they had agreed there. Um, was that they were absolutely tied into this deal for 24 hours after having provided all the certificates and so on, whilst the charters went away and, and made the nomination and collected the shipper's approval and the receiver's approval. Um, I don't think I don't think it would have occurred to them that they had the the right to pull out of the whole thing. And, and I think if they had, I think the, the charters would have been appalled. I think it would have been the charters um, taking the onus to arbitration if. Um, is another point, Callum. Isn't the point that with this subject, that owners are bound for the twenty-four hours for the one working day, twenty-four hours if it's you know a working day, um, and if the charterers do not go away and get shippers' receivers' approval in that time, as such that they can lift the subject, then um, after the twenty-four hours both parties can walk away. I don't think it just becomes a fixed contract. So my, I, think that's, I think that's right. I think that's what they tried to agree. But my reading of this judgment is that there was no agreement 
until that subject was lifted. And that's quite clear at the uh, paragraph 87 where the judge says, I have no doubt that the relevant subject in the present case, namely shipper slash receiver's approval, falls into the category described by Foxton, J, Carver and Wilford. And there he's talking about um, preconditions. And then later on, um, in that same in that same paragraph, he says a binding contract will therefore only come into existence as and when the charters communicate to the owners that the subjects are lifted. So if there's no binding contract before that point in time, then what are owners bound to? He's not he's not suggesting an analysis where owners are bound to give charters a you know a, a day once they get all of the necessary approvals. He's saying there is no contract. And maybe it's the maybe it is the case that this just wasn't addressed because it, he had absolutely no no need to indulge the kind of hypothetical situations that we're going off on uh, now. But I, but the effect of a precondition is that there's no contract. So it, as as I read that, there's no there is no contract. There's nothing for owners even to walk away from. They're simply saying we we're not we're not going to do this anymore. Yeah, I, I think it's it, it's one thirteen paragraph one thirteen, isn't it? Where he goes on. Um, to say equally that the charters may have decided not to lift their subject notwithstanding the receipt of approval from both shipper and receiver. This would have been legally permissible, even if not morally justified, because there was no binding contract until the subjects were lifted. Um, and he went on to then cite an old case, a 1921 case, um, the Kokusai and Johnson case. It must follow that the same is true for owners. It would be, it would be morally unjustified but on this judgment, there's there's no binding contract. He's very clear in a number of paragraphs. There's no binding contract. There's no binding contract. He doesn't say there is a contract that bound owners to perform in the event that charters lifted their subjects. He says there's no binding contract. And if there's no binding contract, then there's no binding contract on owners either. It's interesting looking at this case from um, from an analytical perspective because the judge has had to deal with both section 67 and section 69 in one go um and as i said at the outset a section 67 jurisdiction challenge is a full rehearing hearing de novo whereas uh, um, a challenge under section 69 is on um, an error of law and um a large part of the the decision dealt with whether there was an arbitration agreement that was um, that was fixed or, or or bound, irrespective of whether there was um, the balance of the contract or not. And um, we all in here understand the the principle of separability of arbitration agreements to the main contracts. Um, and so the the judge conducted a full hearing and then looked at this question of whether there was a separable arbitration agreement that where the parties had, as the, the owners argued, had agreed to um, a, a forum to decide any any issues arising out of the, the contract or the alleged contract um, that was separable, that stood on its own two feet and was not subject to the subject. And um, the, the judge l- looked at the whole analysis of the subject through that lens. And I, and I thought it was really an interesting... Um, way that he arrived at the decision and i wonder whether in some ways that framing of the question led to some of these really clear statements as to as as to what he was thinking as soon as you started saying that i realized that you're you're spot on to bring that up because that confirms it that confirms that you know in the judge's view owners would have been able to walk away from this deal as well because if owners were bound to something then what was the law and jurisdiction clause of the agreement that owners were bound to? If, if owners are bound to anything, then the arbitration agreement would have to have been triggered because they would have, there would have been something that charters, charters would have had to be able to go to a jurisdiction to get the relief that they sought against owners. And that would mean that the arbitration agreement would have to have been triggered. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. The judge had to come down in very black and white terms on is there an agreement at all? And if no, then there's no arbitration agreement either. Um, and he relied on some previous authorities, including the Pacific Champ case, um, to say to say that you know this has actually been lit- that, you know this has been litigated before, and there is authority that where there's a subject um, where there's an arbitration agreement in a contract which is subject to um, something happening, 
and that thing hasn't happened, then the arbitration agreement also falls away, notwithstanding the principles of separability. Um, but to make that finding, he had to find that there was no, that there was simply no contract. Um, so it must be the case that you know owners would also be free to to step away. I, I mean, I think I think again, <laughs> what I what I think is 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 you know you come back again to chartering practice, which have really surprising implications when you put them in uh, when you put what is standard chartering practice in front of lawyers or a judge. The judge, for example, found significance in the fact that the the subjects were in bold um, at the top of the recap. Now, I don't know whether the broker thought about it when they did that, but certainly I've always put subjects at the bottom of the recap and I don't think I've ever put them in bold. So, you know, does that mean that the, um, does that mean that the subjects then don't have effect on the full recap? I, I'm really surprised. I'm really surprised. It's an interesting point, that one, because I, I kind of had the same reaction when I read it. I'm like, well, um, if the subject appeared in the recap, albeit at the end, um, and not at the top and not in bold, I think it likely would have had the same effect if it if it still sat following this judge's decision or this judge's view. Um, as long as it sat above the or it, it was read as um, having priority over the pro forma. So and and what the judge relied on was the the otherwise uh, otherwise as uh, that. Yeah. Otherwise, as agreed in the recap, um, the pro forma gets gets incorporated with logical amendments. And so, as long as something in the recap is sitting above and is you know uh, yeah it takes priority over the pro forma, then I think the judge would have said it has the same effect, even though in this one it was at the top and in bold. I'm I'm not sure too much turns on that point. Do you think that there is more of a place in these kind of decisions for? expert evidence you know broker expert evidence on what's going on in the market I've, it's an interesting question because it, it in this case it looks as though there was none um paragraph 14 of the judgment says you know in the event the party's arguments have been very largely sorry the party's arguments have very largely been legal arguments based on undisputed documents and in the leonidas there was an attempt to make an argument about um there being a custom of the trade but that's a hard argument to make and you know the judge basically said the the expert evidence wasn't particularly helpful to him because it was a legal question um and i i do wonder about these you know I've, we've seen a couple um over the last year as the market's been quite volatile we saw the leonidas we saw this one i don't think either of those decisions are incorrect um and they just happen to be the two that have gone through the courts so it's difficult to 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 kind of suggest anything you know anything otherwise, but I I do wonder how well the law is reflecting what the commercial you know the commercial intention of the documents actually are right now. I'm I'm just not sure the law is quite grasping the nuance, and it seems like it's very black and white, and it's saying you know this is there's no deal until there's a deal, and here there's no deal, and I, I'm just not sure that's what actually the parties intended, and that surely should be the principal point guiding what the what we, what the what the law is trying to achieve. Yeah, I, I I think you're right about that, Callum. I think if your analysis is correct, um, and um, under this set of subjects, the owners could have walked away if they'd felt like it in during the subject period. I think that's completely contrary to what the what the chartering market thought those subjects meant. So you're, you're right. But there is there is an argument. I, I didn't see it referenced in this case, but there is there is a case, an old case called I think the the Mirac M E R A K, and in that case it was the sale of a ship, and it was subject to survey. So the the, the sale of the ship was subject to survey. So it was the buyer who was had the benefit of this you know subject to survey um, clause, and. I'm, sli I'm slightly, I'm, I'm, I may be misremember misremembering it. It's been a while since I read it, but I think that the seller in that case said, I want out of the deal. And the court said, no, it's only the buyer that has, you know, that can, um, they can pull out the deal at this stage. Um, and they can only do so on reasonable grounds following the survey. Um, and that was an example of where the court found that there was a performance condition rather than a precondition. And I think if you could, you could make the same argument here that, that that actually that's a neater way of of dealing with this type of subject too which is that 
you know, it, it's, it is that suspensive performance condition. And if, if the shipper and receivers don't give their approval, then charters are within their rights not to proceed, but they, but they can only exercise that, um, they can only exercise that discretion reasonably, i.e. the shipper and receivers do have to have just decided not to, not to, um, approve the ship. Yeah, I, I, I have troubles as well with, with this, um, and the idea that the parties can walk away when they have defined a period of time within which certain subjects either will be lifted or not. My, my, my reading of that is that um, for the 24 hours, both parties have committed um, to fix if certain things happen. Um, and if those things don't happen within that period of time, then the con- then whatever they had agreed falls away, um, and then it's too bad. So it, it it it's you know as, as put before, it's an option that the charters have to take this fixture, um, which they can secure within those twenty four hours by um, uh, by getting uh, shippers and receivers approval and communicating that to the owners. The I think where where the hypothetical may not line up well with this case and this decision is that that didn't happen within 24 hours. So, so we're, we're, in a, we're in a scenario where we're after the 24 hours, it wasn't communicated, we're then post, post the subject arguably uh, in terms of the time period and then what happens? I, I think at that point you you don't have the, the charter doesn't have the option anymore. It falls away, so to speak. Um, and so you know, in I, I'm not I'm not sure that had within the 24 hours owners walked away, that would have been the result that they could have just walked away within those 24 hours. I I, I struggle with that. Um, I think I think that has to be. I mean, I'll be I'll be interested as well. And anyone listening, you know, jump in if if I'm if I'm getting this totally off piece. But I think that if there was a if if there had been a contract by which owners were bound for twenty four hours to leave charters to leave the door open to charters effectively, then the decision on the arbitration agreement would have to have been the other way. They would have to have found that there, that that contract was governed by something. And it would have had to have been governed by the arbitration agreement. And then the arbitrators would have had discretion or would have had jurisdiction, sorry, to make a finding that the 24 hours had elapsed, that whatever owners had agreed had passed and the owners were then entitled to, um, were entitled to withdraw the ship if they, if they chose to in our hypothetical world. And it's why I, I raised at the outset that this case is, it's not just a shipping subjects case. This is an arbitration case, and I know Anchor got a mention in here, Fiona Trust got a mention in here, some of the other heavy-hitting arbitration agreement cases, or at least arbitration cases, um, got touched on in this. And you can see why that is, because subjects arise in lots of different scenarios. And and I I suppose that's, that's the point, though, isn't it? We keep coming back to what type of subject are we talking about, and... Um, I know you met, you said before, Callum, is the law here reflecting what's properly happening in the market? Um, and I, of course, I you know I endorse that view, and and I think it's a it's a good question to ask. But I do also wonder whether the market is not, and I say this with the greatest respect, but it is is not appreciating the effect of what certain subjects mean at law. It's a little bit like when you have parties um, agreeing to agree, right? We see, we see that a, a lot of the time and we've had to explain to many clients that an agreement to agree is pretty much useless. Um, you know, you might as well not even have it in there. It, there's some nuance around endeavour clauses and things like that, but, you know, just an outright agreement to agree doesn't do much as a matter of law and yet, many market participants think that it has some kind of effect. Well, we're, we're, we're saying in advance what we will do, but you're not actually yet agreeing it. And I just wonder whether there's an element here where there's a, an education process on, well, if you want to agree to a, um, a precondition 
subject, this is what it will do, right? And these are the words you can use for that. If you want to agree on um, uh, a performance condition, a performance subject, then this is the language to use. Um, and, and, and then the next point, coming back to the arbitration agreement, if you want to agree on an arbitration agreement um, iris- to, to rule on the meaning of the subject, you can do that. Like you can find language to achieve these things more clearly. Um, and so I do come back to the original point that I, I think there's a drafting question here. I really do. I think it's, I think that's right. It's a very good point. That there is a where the, where there's a gap between what's happening and what the law is, then there is you know the gap could be filled with with education. But the first thing I think is people need to know that the gap exists, and I think this is an area where it does. I agree. Um, so look, coming back to the decision uh, and. Time just escapes us, doesn't it, (laughs) Callum? (laughs) Every week. (laughs) Every week we kind of look down at the the, the clock and think, wow, have we been talking that long? Um, Well, at least I know I do. And so so coming back to the decision, the the judge um, ultimately decided um, that quite um, conclusively or overwhelmingly that – there was no arbitration agreement for the purposes of the Section 67 um, decision and that if uh, he was wrong on that, that is that um, the subject was such that it was a subject over the arbitration agreement and the main contract, they um, they were to be considered together as one um, and they fell or stood together and he, um, the judge's decision was that they fell together. Um, so that that dealt with the matter. That was that was the primary finding. There was no um, no arbitration agreement, no contract. Um, in end of the matter, the judge went further then to um, deal with the scenario of if he was wrong on the arbitration agreement, um, what would have been the position hypothetically under um, section sixty nine and. Um, the courts will do this often because th- this matter could well be appealed on the arbitration agreement question. Um, and then if that is upheld, there would then um, the, the court of appeal would then look at, well, what would have been the position under Section 69 under the error of law um, appeal? And the judge on that score also went through to look at the grounds for leave to appeal on an error of law, looked at um, you know whether this was whether the question was subject to serious doubt. Indeed, he found it was obviously wrong. Um, also looked at the question of whether there was a, a matter of public importance. Um, and I thought that was worth ma- making note of that the court found that the issue of priority between a recap clause, co- yeah, a recap clause, and a clause in the pro forma. That question was something of wide application in many, many, many charters, if not all of them <laughs> that we see. Um, and uh, that question of how they interact with each other, and as we discussed earlier, that um, the, the court found here that the the recap clause had priority over the pro forma clause and the word otherwise meant that they weren't to be harmonised. One was supposed to be read over the other. That was of significant public importance to justify getting into the court for for the question of law um and so you know the court ultimately found on the on if if it turned on a uh, section 69 question that that also would have gone against the owners and um the judge would have ruled in favor of the charterers yeah overall a um a good win for the charterers, having having uh, found themselves in a bit of a difficult position where they went through one of their colleagues' email inboxes to have the unfortunate discovery of an arbitration award against them. They managed to get themselves out of that particular hole. Um, and yeah, they won on all fronts. But I think it's a really interesting judgment. I think it throws up a lot of questions. I think it shines a light on the the discrepancy between what it seems like people in the market and i'm very grateful for tim for being on this case in particular because uh you know it's 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 nice to have somebody who actually sees what's going on in the market rather than just us as lawyers saying what we think is going on um but that that difference between what's actually happening in the market and what's happening in the in in the commercial courts is an important point for a lot of you know and this isn't a trifling matter this is 
this is the this is whether or not you can you know put a deal on your books. It's a it's a big issue whether you know whether whether at what point a deal is concluded, um, particularly in a market that's been as volatile as it has been in the last few years. So I think um, yeah, there's a lot to take away from here. And the main thing, as you say, Luke, is the drafting's got to be you know watertight on these subjects if you want them to to do what um, what you think they should. Any final thoughts on this one, Tim? Any any matters that occurred to you when you when you read through it that we haven't managed to get into? Because for our for our audience, um, those who who listen will know this point well. But we don't we don't jump on and compare notes um, prior to chatting about. That includes with our our special guests. So if there's something that's been uh, you know that you've been wanting to get out there, now's the time, Tim. Well, I, I, I mainly enjoyed the fact that the um, Charter's chartering guy decided not to tell his employers that that, that, <laughs> <laughs> that, he, that they were going to arbitration and that they'd had an award made against them. I, I was I had to read that twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that's the standard protocol. It seemed a little convenient, didn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, that that was an interesting, uh, let's say, excuse. But yeah, funny I, one. I think the other. I think. I think. You know, maybe the final point as, as well from, from a kind of chartering practitioner's point of view is that, you know, re- recaps can be very, very short. They can just be a few lines that encompass the main points, the freight rate, the lay days, the demerge rate, um, whatever it may be. Or they can be really, really long. So some of them are virtually um, a precy of the charter party. And in this recap, they had made a decision to put the um, arbitration clause in the recap, which is by no means... It's not unusual, but um, it, it doesn't happen all the time. And But actually, the decision to put the arbitration clause in the recap um, turned out to be a really big topic of conversation because if there had been no arbitration clause in the recap, um, there wouldn't have been a, I assume there wouldn't have been a discussion about whether the arbitrator had jurisdiction here. And that's something that the chartering people will probably have done without even thinking about the consequences of doing something like that there's a lot of unintended consequences in this one. there is that that's yeah. absolutely right yeah absolutely yeah. The, the, the bold wording the yeah the, the law and arbitration clause and the the subjects itself you know I, I totally agree. Um, look, I, I found this fascinating, this case. Um, there was a lot more we could get into, uh, but um, I, I think we've we've gotten into the into the heart or the nut the nub of the issues here and um, we've really highlighted a, a question as to whether practice is marrying up with the law, which is always a, a fun one to, to explore. So, look, thank you very much for your time, Tim. We, we very much appreciate you joining us, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. Um, thank you to, to, to all you out there who have um, stuck with us through this, uh, this analysis of, of subjects and and particularly this, this DHL decision. Um, if you've got any questions for any of us, please please do get in touch. Um, and you know, as, and as always, if if this is your first um, your first time of listening to us, we'd be delighted if you became one of our subscribers and followed us on one of the usual places like Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts, um, and and shared this with with your team. So we we appreciate all the support and thank you for listening in. Uh, until next time. Uh, take care, everyone. Uh, thanks, Callum. Uh, any other remarks from you, mate? No, nothing. Nothing else. Cheers. Cheers to Tim. Uh, Thank you very much us. for having me on. I really enjoyed it.